You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile and the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, offering professional grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 62. The Third Republic Part 2, The Shadow of Victory. This week, a big thank you goes out to Edwin for their donation, and to Ido, Gary, and Luke, and John for choosing to support the podcast on Patreon, where they get access to ad-free episodes plus special patron-only episodes released once a month. Head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members to find out more information. I know at this point it's almost a joke on this podcast, but when discussing events in interwar France, you have to start with the First World War. In France, anybody who was over 30 years old in 1939 remembered the First World War. Most of their fathers had fought in the war, and those men who had fought in it were still in the prime of their economic and political power. To say that the war influenced French political, economic, military, and social developments during the 20s and 30s is to understate its impact. Along with the impact of the war was also the consequences of the peace that had been signed, with the devastating understanding that it was very likely that another war with Germany or some other power was very likely. When looking back at interwar France today, there is also another almost impossible complication. We know that France completely fails in its defense of the German attack in 1940. We know that it would be a devastating French defeat. This makes it very tempting to look at interwar France and search not for what happened, but why, simply you know, searching for reasons for the later failure. In this search, it can be easy to lose the actual course of events. It makes it easy to read too much into certain decisions and not others, and to judge those decisions based on future events. Last episode, I really dove deep into this when I was talking about the Maginot Line, and I will almost certainly mention it again. But for now, we're going to discuss the political and social developments in France during the 1920s and 1930s. These developments are important in and of themselves, but also play a role in understanding why France made the decisions that it made during the 1930s, which then led to the events of 1940 and beyond. Over the next five episodes, we will track the course of those developments from the end of the First World War to the beginning of the Second, at which point we will take a few episodes to focus strictly on the evolution of French military thought during this same period, a crucial topic not just for the events after 1939, but before 1939 as well as the French military was an essential piece of any active resistance to German actions during the 1930s. During the First World War, the French political climate had changed, as everyone sort of came together in this massive coalition in the search of victory. The socialists and much of the left would officially exclude themselves from that coalition, but this in no way meant that they did not fully support the war, and were very supportive of anything that would result in victory. What this meant was that at the end of the war, the center and the right, led by the Radical Party and Prime Minister Clemenceau, enjoyed massive support as the government that had led the nation to victory. This would also affect support for the parties after the war, because radicals and members of their coalition were identified with victory, and they could portray their political rivals on the left as pacifists and anti-French. But this simple political divide could not completely insulate the center and the right from the very real problems that France would face after the war, the disappointing aspects of the peace agreement, which Clemenceau was assigned responsibility for, the economic problems that would be felt as the nation tried to rebuild, and just the general disunity that happens after any long war, even for victorious nations. They would all take their toll and cause political support on the right to fracture. Although there were still some areas that there was enough agreement to prevent certain societal reforms from taking place during the 1920s, 
For example, attempts to give French women the right to vote would fail in 1919 due to the conservative groups that found enough unity to vote it down in the Chamber of Deputies, delaying French women's suffrage until after the Second World War. In some ways, the right was only saved by the even deeper fractures on the left, as the divide between the socialists and the communists would deepen, as relations between the two groups in all nations were generally split, in no small part due to events in Russia. The one similarity between all of these groups, from the communists on the far left to the proto-fascists on the far right, was that they all faced the same problems within French society. Economic problems, demographic problems, the questions of immigration, and then foreign relations. They were all topics that successive French governments would rise and fall on during the 1920s. So it seems justified to start today by looking at these problems and their causes. During the First World War, the effort involved in winning the war had pushed the French economy to the edge of an abyss. As with many other nations, the French government was forced to turn to its citizens and sell war bonds to help fund all of the various purchases that had to be made during the war, especially foreign imports. When this was done, there was the understanding that they would be paid back, and this expectation would play a role in keeping the French government on the gold standard in the 1920s. If they devalued the franc or let inflation occur in a, in a major way, those war bonds would reduce in value, and with so many people having purchased the bonds and in large numbers, this could have serious consequences. How serious? Well, in other nations, the end of the war brought revolution, or close to it, and economic problems were often a very important driving force in those revolutions. War bonds did not cause those revolutions, just like they were not the sole economic problem that France had during the 1920s and 30s, but it was just a large, one of a large number of situations that would affect economic decision-making. Then, of course, the Great Depression would hit, uh, the rest of the world, and France would actually stay partially isolated from that for a bit, until the British and Americans devalued their currencies, and then they started having problems. These problems would cause France to eventually devalue the franc in 1936, probably far after they should have, and certainly after it would have had the greatest impact. These economic concerns and the long shadow cast by the First World War then played a role in not just political decision-making, but also on the military side as well, an influence we discussed at some length last episode. To avoid such catastrophic economic problems in the next war, French military leaders felt that they had to hold on to as much valuable northeastern territory as possible. Foreign trade was also a problem, with more French imports originating from the British Empire than from French imperial holdings which resulted in a slow drain on the French economy. One of the hidden reasons that France was tied so closely to Britain during the 1930s was the, this economic relationship that they could not risk breaking. There were also a whole host of other economic ties between the two nations, like the fact that more imports were offloaded off of British ships in French ports than from French ships. These types of economic ties were not necessarily a bad thing, but from both sides it would put influence on politicians to make certain decisions. The French were importing a lot from the British Empire, while the British Empire was gaining a lot of benefits from being such an important part of the French economy. All of these items and many more would be a part of what were felt to be necessary economic preparations for war, especially due to the fact that the French firmly believed that whatever happened, the next war would be a long one, years in length just like the last one. And such a lengthy conflict required a different and more all-encompassing set of considerations when it came to being prepared and that included economic preparations and also economic relations with other nations. Economic problems were just one problem facing France, another was around demographics. 1.2 million men had died either during the war or immediately afterwards. There was also a drastic drop in the birth rate during the war years, understandable with so many men at the front, and this meant that there were around 1.4 million fewer births during the war years than might otherwise have been expected. This was very troubling to a French nation that had already had a pretty low birth rate before the war, and fueled a push for French families to have more children and quickly. Supporting these efforts to increase the size of French families would become a more important part of many, if not most, political party platforms, and several parties would all portray themselves as the party of the French family. In 1920, the first official French Mother's Day would be celebrated, and 50,000 mothers with five or more children would all be given an official medal from the government. There would also be a law put into place that gave fathers more votes depending on how many children they had under the age of 16, which translated procreation directly into political power. 
All of these efforts had disappointing results, though, and after a very brief and small baby boom after the war was over, the French birth rate settled down to a disappointing number. This was a problem from a military perspective, but also from an economic one. It meant that the French population was aging, and there was the looming problem of the missing millions that would have been reaching their economic primes in the late 1930s. As the birth rate continued to not increase, a search for a cause or somebody or something to blame became an increasingly hot topic of conversation. Just like in other societies, many religious and conservative groups placed the blame on the changes within society. The exact list of changes that had occurred that were all blamed could be copy and pasted from many other nations. Pornography, women's rights movements, the decline of traditional family values, you know, that kind of stuff. Along with all of these problems, there was also the fact that many more women were working in some way outside the home. This could easily be hidden if you look at some of the statistics from this period because of how those statistics were skewed towards male workers in male-dominated industries. The skew of the data would become far more important during the harsh economic years of the Depression when many government statistics were based on manufacturing and other heavily unionized professions, which neglected many professions dominated by women, including the textile and garment industries. There would eventually be some recognition that part of the French birth rate problem was related to the economy, and this would prompt the Family Allowance Act in 1932 which essentially provided tax and economic benefits for families with at least two children, but this was really too little too late. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing, and now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere and each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com No purchase necessary. VTW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire enslaved Frederick Douglass, risking his life for liberty, and about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today, and join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode, where I'd like to tell you a story. Instead of improving over the course of the 1930s, the French birth rate would instead continue to decrease, with 1936 being one of the lowest years on record. Now this can partially be explained by the fact that it was in the years around 1936 that those missed births from the First World War were most heavily felt, because in 1936, those missing wartime babies would have been between the ages of 18 and 22, the perfect time to start having their own babies. But there were also other changes, like the fact that by the late 1930s, there was a trend for French couples to wait longer before having children. This would all culminate in the Code de la Famille in 1939, which provided even greater economic benefits to families that had larger numbers of children. But it also contained some forced changes to society, like penalties for abortion, which were increased, and laws targeting the distribution of pornography. This law was far too late to influence French demographics during the war. And in fact, between 1935 and 1945, there were more deaths than births in France almost every single year. From a military perspective, things got even worse. Because France also had a problem whereby there were simply a smaller percentage of men fit for military service due to poor childhood nutrition and the scourge of childhood diseases. This meant that even of the smaller number of men that were of military age, less would be able to serve in time of war when compared with, say, Germany. 
to put all this population talk into perspective, from 1900 to 1939, the German population increased by 36%, the Italian by 33, the British by 23, and the French by 3. Yes, 3% over 39 years. One of the ways that many nations might address a demographic problem around birth rates would be to import people, or more correctly, to allow people to import themselves via immigration or as refugees. And the French did quite a bit of this. In fact, the percentage of the French population made up of immigrants and refugees would double during the 1920s. They would have the highest immigration rate in the world for parts of this period. But such a large number of immigrants and refugees caused the almost predictable backlash against them from certain groups within society. They began to be blamed for the problems that France was facing, and there were growing fears of that they might cause a rise in crime and, and a further decline of French society. These fears caused serious changes to occur in French immigration policy during the 1930s. Part of this was driven by the sudden decline in French economic fortunes, with the belief that allowing further large numbers of immigrants into France would put further strain on a French economy that had already been hit hard by the Great Depression. Also during this time, immigration policy would ebb and flow based on the political leadership at any given time. In early 1933, the Daligdir government began to put stronger restrictions on entry, but this was replaced in October 1933 by the Albert Serrault government. Serrault's government would make immigration more difficult and, and reduce the rate at which refugees were allowed into the nation, sort of clamping down even further, at least partially due to some subtle and not so subtle racism. But then during 1933, there were also large numbers of Germans who came into France fleeing the new Nazi government. This caused concerns in the military about their loyalty to France. These concerns were voiced the strongest in areas of eastern France where those German immigrants and refugees were settling, along with others from elsewhere in Europe. When the Popular Front then took power, they were generally very open with their refugee and immigration policies. But then when Daladier came back into power, he began implementing heavy restrictions, both in the number of refugees allowed into the nation and the number given permanent residency. Behind all of these changes was the idea that France was reaching a saturation point when it came to refugees, particularly refugees, and that the nation simply could not handle any more. In 1939, refugees would also be forced to enter military service if they planned to stay in France more than a few months, a more direct method of trying to capitalize on their presence in the country. Going through the quick list of immigration changes is a great example of the kind of, of flailing that the French government did for much of the interwar period. There were many different governments, and while they often just involved the same group of men cycling through different cabinet positions, there was often a lot of indecision or, or reversals of previous decisions. This complete instability in the executive positions of the French government were in some ways a design feature of the government, preventing one person or party from having too much power. But it was also indicative of the divided nature of French politics during this period. These divisions would prevent many of the reforms that were probably necessary to fix French economic and societal problems. Unfortunately, one of the pieces of French society that all of the political parties seemed to agree on, the adherence to the gold standard and a balanced government budget, proved to be an anchor around the French economy, even if for several years it appeared to be a benefit. But that does not mean that there, was not, there were not positive movements in other areas, like in foreign policy. You know, for example, the 1928 Kellogg-Briand Pact was seen as a major development as it was signed by 15 nations from around the world and all of the major military powers, even if it would prove to be exceptionally hollow. In the early 1930s, there would be a string of different attempts to limit the proliferation of arms and military strength around Europe and the world. Some of these, like the official League of Nations Disarmament Conference, was simply the final stage of what had been agreed to back in 1919 with the Versailles Treaty. When the conference opened in 1932, there were instantly problems which in hindsight seemed obvious. Nobody really wanted to commit to strong reductions of military strength, least of all the French, and it did not help that the French had one of the stronger militaries in the world during the years of the conference, and were constantly accused of being the problem in the process. But of course the French, seeing themselves as the victims of German aggression not once but twice in the preceding century, would refuse to agree to any form of disarmament without strong guarantees of security, not just from friendly nations, but also from Germany. There was also just too many differences in opinion between the nations involved. Or as Robert Young would say in In Command of France, French Foreign Policy and Military Planning, 1933-1940, quote, 
Thus it was that the fate of the European disarmament rested from the start on the blameless notion of equality, a notion, however, that was defined by the Germans as actuality and by the French as potentiality. The chasm was never bridged. End quote. I really like that quote. I've become really attached to that quote over the last few months because it does a good job of explaining why there was this massive difference in opinion between the various nations at the disarmament conferences, not just among German and Germany and France, but everybody. How you defined military strength was different depending on which nation you were and what your concerns were. And there, there were differences that were impossible to bridge because every nation was different. While it's easy to blame the failure of the conference on the French or anybody else, it was probably doomed to failure from the very beginning. Every nation just had different views of what should be included, and at the time of the conference, they, they were already far enough away from the war years that had been so important to earlier agreements like the Washington Naval Treaty that the war experiences had very little effect. Those earlier agreements had been signed in the shadows of the First World War, when economic and societal pressure was at its peak. By 1932, these pressures had dissipated and nations were instead looking to make themselves stronger, not agree to reduce their militaries. Back in Paris, there was pressure from both sides, with the French right demanding that no agreement be signed, while the French left demanded some level of concessions. It was not a recipe for stable political leadership. In Germany, they were, they were also moving towards a reintroduction of conscription shortly after Hitler took power, which killed the possibility of any future agreements. But any possibility of a disarmament agreement was probably dead long before that declaration. In general, there's this problem with France and the disarmament conferences, where they're always seen as kind of the bad guy because they were very hesitant, very concerned about giving in to anybody else. And a lot of that came back to the two problems we've already discussed, the economic and demographic issues that France was having. France was incredibly concerned about the potential of other nations to outpace it in the military sphere. Sure, the French had a powerful military in the early 1930s, but they knew that if people were allowed to build as much as they wanted, they knew if the Germans were sort of removed from the shackles of Versailles, they would very rapidly find themselves in a position where they would be drastically behind due to the economic and demographic strength that the Germans had in comparison to France. Now, a lot of this was in the future when the disarmament talks were at their height, you know, 1932, 1933. And in 1933, Hitler would take power, and, and it can be tempting to sort of see that as like a, a real turning point in, in European politics, and, and it would prove to be. But when it actually happened in 1933, uh, French intelligence services uh, believed that the Nazi party was too divided to survive, and that would have, it would eventually tear itself apart due to the differences in beliefs between Hitler and Strasser that we discussed so many episodes ago. This would of course not be the case, but it's hard to blame the French for believing this, because plenty of German leaders also did uh, at the time. 1933, while seeing Hitler take power, would also see a meeting at the behest of Mussolini, which saw France, Britain, Italy, and Germany all sign the Four Power Pact, a very welcome development which seemed good for peace in Europe. Initially, Mussolini was aiming high with this conference. He wanted to essentially remake the concert of Europe, which had, at least in Mussolini's mind, ensured peace for almost a century after the defeat of Napoleon. However, during the discussions, any possible real impact that the agreement may have had was slowly removed by all of the parties involved. Or as Jean-Baptiste Duracell would say in France and the Nazi Threat, Quote, the vicissitudes of the Four Power Pact stemmed from the deeply contradictory goals each nation had assigned it. In the first Italian draft, Article 2 stated that, quote, the Four Powers reaffirmed the principle of revision of the peace treaties, according to the clauses of the Covenant of the League of Nations, whenever situations arise that might lead to conflicts between states, end quote. Mussolini, who supported the dissatisfied Central European powers of Austria, Hungary, and Bulgaria, saw this as a means to eventually grant them compensation. For France, which was allied with the satisfied countries of Eastern Europe, the pact's main goal was to be to keep Germany in line. End quote. So many of these efforts during the 1930s, while agreed to in some way by many nations, were mostly participated in to solve domestic political concerns that their nation was not doing enough to maintain peace. However, pretty much all of the conferences, all of the agreements, those that were signed anyway, were simply robbed of any real power because none of the political leaders involved wanted to make real actual concessions 
to others. By the time that they were ready to do so in the late 1930s, it was already too late, and any possible chances of a long-term peace had already passed them by. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode as we take a deep dive into French foreign policy during the 1930s, especially their attempts to ensure good relations with Italy, which the French saw as a critical ally in any future war with Germany.